I'm so happy today to have Laura Simpson, who is the Chief Operating Officer at the Autoimmune Association, which we are going to learn a little bit more about today and also her story. So welcome, Laura. Thank you so much. And can we start by just letting us know a little bit about where you live and what is your relationship to autoimmune disease? Absolutely. And first off, thank you so much, Cheryl, for having me. It's an honor to be here. I really love any opportunity to talk about autoimmune disease. So I live in Michigan, which is a really great place this time of year. I love the fall, uh, winter, not so much. Um, and I have a few connections to autoimmune disease. So I myself have two autoimmune related diseases. So I live with inflammatory arthritis, and hydrodenitis superativa, or better known as HS. And both my family and my husband's family are riddled with autoimmune disease, as we find uh, with so many people living with autoimmune diseases, as they tend to cluster not only in individuals, but also in families. Um, as you mentioned, I'm also the chief operating officer of the Autoimmune Association, whose mission is to lead the fight against autoimmune disease by advocating and collaborating to improve healthcare, advance research, and empower the community through every step of the journey. That's incredible. And, you know, it's, it's one, I'm sure it's just so rewarding to be able to like bring some of your patient experience to your work, you know, at the um, association. How long have you been there? I have been there for about six and a half years, and it's interesting because a lot of my autoimmune experience in terms of the diagnoses have happened while I've been here, and I will say that our incredible patients and patient advocates in the community have really helped me to, you know, find my own voice within autoimmune disease and, and seek to find my own diagnoses. Wow. Well, yeah, you're leading me perfectly to the next question. Um, I'm I've always liked to hear about people's diagnosis story or diagnosis saga, as we sometimes call it. And so, yeah, how, how and when did you get diagnosed? What were some of your first signs? Yeah, that's a great question. And saga it is. So I have suffered from pain and fatigue really since I was a child. And I remember knowing when the weather was going to change because my right ring finger without fail would hurt. And I would tell my mom this and she would just say, oh yeah, yeah, that's just arthritis. So I literally grew up thinking that arthritis was a completely normal part of life, a normal part of childhood. And I love my mother. I know she was doing the absolute best she could with the information she had. Um, looking back, I do wish that we had mentioned the symptoms to my doctors when I was younger. Um, again, I just thought that the pain and the fatigue was a normal part of life and that I just didn't push through it as well as other people. Um, fast forward to my 20s and 30s, and by this point, I had lived enough to know that it was not a normal part of, of my life. And um, I told countless primary doctors about my pain and my fatigue and they would run some tests, but honestly, nothing changed. Um, no one ever mentioned rheumatology or seeing a rheumatologist or anything related to the joint pain and, and some of the fatigue and, and brain fog that I was experienced experiencing. Yeah. So, and I just want to jump in really ah. and say how common it is for people, how common it is for people to blame themselves. Like you said, well, you uh -huh. thought maybe I just wasn't pushing through maybe, you know, I just need to try harder or something. And it's just so tragic to know that like your body was, you know, riddled with inflammation at this time, but you didn't, you know, no one knew how to diagnose it at that time or didn't do the right tests. And so I just, I'm just, my heart goes out to like little you and anyone else listening who's in that same position. And just, I think it's just, little tiny teachable moment, but it's really important to trust your body. Cause I did this, a similar thing where at first I was like, well, it must just be like, maybe I didn't sleep enough or maybe, you know, I need to, yeah. It, and it was like, and it, I wish I had trusted my body a little more and advocated for a diagnosis earlier, but hindsight is 2020, as we said. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And this is so common. And 
I do think that there's a lot of work and advocacy and, and awareness to be done um, on the healthcare side as well, working with primary doctors. We find this particularly in rural areas where people may not have access to specialists. And, and um, you know, I find some of the heroes, the people that really diagnose autoimmune disease, um, you know, within their within their family practices. So um, certainly a lot of work to be to be done there. So um, on to the journey. So once I started having more specific and really more debilitating pain, unfortunately, is uh, when I started to seek, um, you know, more and more answers. And so it started in my left foot. Um, I was having difficulty walking um, really around the same time, which is kind of fascinating. Um, I was having really bad pain in my jaw. Um, and I also had some issues with my left knee, perhaps from compensating from, from the foot. Um, so I was referred finally to some various specialists and I had imaging done and on all three occasions, so the podiatrist, the orthopedic surgeon, and the jaw specialist all came to the same conclusion, which was that my scans indicated arthritis. And at this point, I was finally referred to a rheumatologist who pretty quickly diagnosed me with, with inflammatory arthritis. Wow. And yeah, so you had been having pain for two decades. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Two to three decades. Yeah. And I mean, I'm so glad you finally got that diagnosis, but it's so heartbreaking to think of like, maybe it wouldn't have progressed as much, you know, if you, if you had gotten identified and treated earlier. And, you know, when you said, you know, the, di the doctor diagnosed you with inflammatory arthritis, um, or indicated that earlier, I, it is something that's come up recently in the room to thrive support groups a few times where people are like, I don't understand even like, is this, is this just like a placeholder diagnosis? Like, you know, was it hard to kind of wrap your head around what that diagnosis meant? Like, cause it wasn't rheumatoid specifically yeah. or psoriatic or ankylosing spondylitis. Yeah, Cheryl, that's a great question. Um, I think it's something that I'm still wrapping my head around if I'm honest. Um, I think working in the autoimmune community, it was really easy for me to think, oh, it's rheumatoid arthritis or, you know, something else. All of my tests, while they indicated the inflammation side, um, you know, my rheumatoid factors came back normal. Um, and it's a weird place to be because you almost feel like an outsider or um, just kind of, you know, generalized inflammatory arthritis. Um, but I will say the more I talk about it and the more I hear about other people's experiences, the more I feel validated and, and um, you know, like my experiences is more common than not. And even though I don't have specific markers that tell me exactly why I have this arthritis, um, inflammatory arthritis, there are tools and there is medication available that, that has helped me significantly to, to change my life. Yeah. I would love to hear a little more about that before we move on to your work at the autoimmune association. Like what have been some of the treatments that have been super helpful? Yeah, that's a great question. So I started a biologic, um, gosh, several years ago now, and I cannot believe the difference that it's made. I mean, the fact that I now get tired and I get forgetful, but it's different than fatigue. It's different than brain fog. The fact that I'm able to stay awake throughout the course of the day, um, you know, remember important things. Um, those have changed so significantly along with my ability to um, be in so much less pain. I didn't end up needing surgery in my knee or my foot. Um, my jaw still hurts, but everything else um, really has has helped tremendously. Um, but along with, with medication, um, really being able to listen to my body, um, to learn how to walk, um, physical therapy was a really important part of it as well. Um, and then really the mental health side of it, uh, making sure that I'm taking care of, of myself and my body. And um, I think there's certainly a diet and exercise component component to it as well. 
Um, so it's the medication is important, but it's really an all encompassing lifestyle change um, to make sure that, um, you know, I'm able to feel my best and, and kind of get through the day the best I can. That makes that makes a lot of sense. And when you were first talking about your really positive, like strong response to the biologic medication, yeah. when we say biologic, it's like shorthand for biologic DMARDs or like disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs. So it's one of the many acronyms. And that is actually sometimes how the doctors figure like are able to determine, is it truly some sort of inflammatory, which for the sake of brevity, we could just say inflammatory arthritis is, is interchangeable with like an autoimmune or auto inflammatory process causing the disease versus like a mechanical like osteoarthritis associated with aging. Although now I, I don't want to say wear and tear because they're not calling it wear and tear anymore for osteoarthritis. But um, but just a little teachable moment for somebody listening. I I always try to like define the terms and try to remember like what was it like before I knew what any even RA as a shortening for rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah. I'm sure I don't always remember to define it. But yeah, like if for example they suspected you had some sort of inflammatory arthritis and you had no response to like prednisone or like a biologic, then they might be like, Hmm, let's go back and see if the, what else it could be. So that's, it, that's sometimes people will tell me, well, they gave me a medicine to just try to see how it responded. Like that seems like such imprecise medicine. And it's like, that is, it doesn't mean that your doctor's blowing you off. That is like a standard process, like, and that that's just the best that our health system can do sometimes. So, yeah. you know, you're an example of it working the success story, which is obviously wonderful. And like you said, combining your lifestyle variables, it's like, um, certainly not an either, or it's a both. And, and I'm glad you mentioned the fatigue and brain fog. Cause so often when people hear arthritis, their brain, as you know, cause you've been working at your foundation longer than I've been doing arthritis life that, um, that yeah, they just think, oh, joint pain. But like you mentioned, fatigue and brain fog, those things, I'm just going to say off, like off of my own, only my own anecdotal experience. I just started an exercise strength training program in the beginning of September. And it's the end of September now. And I'm mm -hmm. shocked at the, um, specifically the brain fog improvements, like my focus, my ability to focus, get things done that I started and like word finding and stuff like that has gotten a lot better over the last month and a little bit the fatigue as well, which is that does track with like exercises, you know, an evidence-based intervention for those things. In addition to the joint pain, um, improving slightly, but the more dramatic improvement has actually been in those kind of more systemic cognitive symptoms, which is interesting. Anyway, that's just my story. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. And, and honestly, one of the things that keeps me motivated is to um, you know, ensure that I'm kind of sharp. And yeah. so sugar, I will tell you is one of my biggest triggers. And that's sad. Um, I'm sorry. I know I I'm, I'm telling you, if I eat sugar, especially on an empty stomach, 20 minutes later, I'm in a total haze. I'm just in this cloud mm -hmm. of haze. And so for me to know that I still want the sugar, but I just have to remember, nope, I want to stay sharp. Um, yeah. you know, I want to kind of function to my best ability. And so for me, avoiding sugar is, is a big part of it, which I don't always do, but again, moderation. Yeah. And you have to weigh the cost benefit analysis of like quality of life and, and stuff like that too. Cause I do think like, yeah, a, depriving yourself of something that brings you joy is not always super healthy either, unless it's something yeah. like gluten where like if you have celiac disease like obviously you do have to be really strict you know yes, so, exactly my husband yeah. actually has auto oh. or has celiac and so um he follows a gluten-free diet um I actually started it hoping it would help me it didn't yeah um, me neither I, or I sorry I do gluten-free but not for my rheumatoid arthritis it helps my um GI bloating not to be like TMI ah. but um, yeah I have like you know IBS, like I know it's kind of like a general catch all, like irritable bowel syndrome. So, um, along with gastro, a, a long time ago, diagnosis of gastroparesis, which seems to be, which is in the dysautonomia family, but that seems to be to me for in my body periodic. It's not a constant, like I'll have flare ups of like, oh, I'm not digesting very fast. But um, I was always, always bloated. I just thought that's how stomachs felt. 
you know? And I was like, I guess I'm just a wimp. Cause like if, every time I eat, I feel crappy, but oh, well I have to eat to survive. And then when I went gluten-free, I was like, whoa. <laughs> And no. anyway, sorry, sorry. So back, back to your husband. No, and I know it works for, for many people. Um, yeah. I'm glad you're mentioning the gut issues because yeah. there is so much overlap that we're still trying to identify. Um, but certainly, um, you know, the gut and gut issues can, you know, plague a lot of these, um, yeah. these areas and these symptoms. And it's kind of a vicious cycle, um, again, to make sure that our bodies are, are kind of operating at full speed. Yeah, it's so true. And I will say this is anecdotally connecting the dots, but when I got accurately diagnosed and treated, I got diagnosed in 2003 with gastroparesis first, and then like eight or nine months later, got diagnosed with, or sorry, end of 2002, diagnosed with gastroparesis, middle of 2003, diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. When I got on fast track to like methotrexate plus Enbrel, and my RA went into remission, my stomach got so much better. I gained, I lost like 30 pounds off of like a pretty small frame. Wow. And then I gained it all back. Like, and it was like really interesting. Anyway, so that's a whole other thing. But speaking of, yeah. you know, so we're talking about the complexities and all these variables that go together. Yeah. And that I'm I'm curious, you know, for you working at the Autoimmune Association, that's part of the role of nonprofit, you know, so associations is to help, right? promote, you know, patient advocacy, patient education. And so what, I'm just curious, what led you, you know, to working there? And I'd love to just hear more. What's the latest and greatest stuff going on at the Autoimmune Association? Yeah, well, I'm super excited to share. Um, Autoimmune is something that's always been near and dear to my heart. Like I said, even before my diagnoses, um, it's, it's run in my family. Um, and what's interesting about autoimmune disease is that it pops up differently in different people. So my sister, she has celiac disease. I have cousins that have Hashimoto's and thyroid issues. Um, mine, uh, you know, one is dermatological, and then there's that um, inflammatory arthritis. Um, so it's it's something that is not often thought of as its own disease category. And that's something that we at the Autoimmune Association want to make sure that we are um, kind of putting front and center. So unfortunately, autoimmune disease is a growth industry. Um, we are really where cancer was, I'd say 20 years ago. Um, there's certainly a need for increased awareness, advocacy, and really coordination. And that's where the Autoimmune Association comes in. Um, there's a common theme that you'll see kind of across our advocacy and awareness efforts, and it really centers around patient empowerment. Uh, patients really are the experts of their disease, and they're central to everything that we do. Um, so whether you're seeking a diagnosis or have been recently diagnosed or have been living with autoimmune disease for years and years, we're here for you. Um, we actually will be hosting next week our third annual Autoimmune Community Summit. It's virtual, it's free, and it brings together thousands of people across the globe um, that are connected through autoimmune disease. And we have really important sessions that were chosen by patients. Um, we have sessions on pain and fatigue, sessions around mental health communicating effectively with your healthcare team, which for somebody like me who took so long um, to get a diagnosis is such a critical piece. Exploring complementary medicine and um, caring for loved ones with an autoimmune disease. So if you have a loved one with an autoimmune disease, Dave Simpson, um, you know, please come and join. We'd love to have you. I'm um, especially excited about our keynote speaker, he is a vitiligo patient advocate and a news personality, Lee Thomas. Um, his TED Talk has over two and a half million views. We're thrilled to have him speak to us about empathy, something I know we could all use more of in our lives. Um, again, it's taking place October 5th and 6th, and we hope to see you there. Yeah, and I I was able to um I attended it last year. I can't did I, I can't even I'm sorry. Now now I'm gonna go against what I said earlier and say that even though my brain power has gotten better, it's not a hundred percent. Can't remember if I spoke at it last year or was more just a ch I did speak at it last year. <laughs> you were a 
powerful moderator. On moderator. The- I just right. remember um, it was before I had met you officially. Yeah. And I just was like, who is this Cheryl Crow? I need to know her. Uh-huh. You were just uh-huh. blown away at your involvement and, and, and really the wisdom and nuggets that you shared with the community. Oh, thank you. Well, that's what, and it, that's why I think virtual conferences really are unique. And I mean, if you would ask me like, you know, 10 years ago, whether I thought I could have just as deep of an experience in a virtual conference as an in-person, I would have been like, no, like the, you know, but now, especially with a lot of immuno, you know, autoimmune patients being immunocompromised and whatnot, um, it's really um, wonderful to have the virtual, you know, structure. It makes, it gives patient access, right? And then what I was going to say, the thing that I really love is connecting in real time. And this is just how my brain works. Cause I know some people are like, I can't read the chat. I can't read the comments while I'm listening to the speaker because it, it makes me not able to focus. For some reason, I'm able to focus on the speaker, but then it's like, if the speaker says something that piques my like interest, I'll be like, oh yeah, that reminds me. Like there was a really good podcast episode of that on X's podcast. And I'll share that in the chat. And then like, you can have little side conversations with people that relate to what the speaker is talking about, or be like, if they're mentioning, you know, oh, I use these um, compression gloves for my pain. Someone might be like, hey, does anyone have a favorite brand? And you can kind of connect to other patients in the chat. Yeah, it's, oh. it's phenomenal to see and to be able to provide that experience. Um, and if you register now, the community itself actually opens on um, September 28th. And oh. there will be opportunities to um, introduce yourself, share your cat pictures, and uh, really meet people from across the globe. And like you said, uh, kind of sharing that, um, you know, wisdom and, and lived experiences is, is just such a critical critical piece of it. A few years ago, we pulled our audience and we continue to do so to see if we should look back into, um, you know, kind of an, an in-person summit or maybe some form of hybrid. And we had staggering results that people love the, the virtual summit. Um, if they want to lay in bed and, and watch a session, yeah. you can. Um, everything is also recorded so you can go back and watch it. And it also really gives us access to the true specialists and thought leaders. And um, it's been, we have a really incredible lineup, um, you included. Oh, um, yes, thank you. We'll be on the uh, pain and management, or I'm sorry, um, pain and fatigue management yes. session. Yeah. I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, but yeah, it's, thank you. It's it's something that we certainly strive to um treat it like an in-person with that engagement with the, the sponsors and exhibitors and, and attendees. And uh, so it's great to hear from your perspective that that's been successful. Yeah. I think that in, you know, it's such a, it's such an important service to provide these, you know, oper- you know, venues for patient education and, and connection. And every time I attend something like this summit, it's like, you see them in the chat, people will just say, wow, like I feel, I don't feel alone anymore. Or I feel like I was so like, I know on the fifth, there's a session on exploring complementary medicine and diet with Dr. Simon Singla, who was actually on the Arthritis Life podcast earlier too. She's awesome. Love her. Yeah. I, I just, I'm still not over the fact that she was a pediatric rheumatologist before she got her RA diagnosis. Like, yeah. what are the odds? But, um, and she's going to help like demystifying medicine, you know, medicine and diet. And that's one of the, I think I would just say my observation through being really active in the patient communities over the last like 10 years on social media and in person is that the diet part is the most confusing. It's yeah. exercise. Like you can kind of break it down right to it's still how to get there is hard, but it's like, you need to get your heart pumping. You need to get, however you need to do that. However you can do that, walking, running, biking, whatever works in your body, get your heart pumping. <laughs> and then you need to um, get muscles, like muscles, you know, strength training, maintain your strength, um, increase your strength, and then stretching, and then potentially yeah. balance. It's like, those are kind of the pillars that you can get at them multiple ways, but they're the pillars. Whereas the diet to me still after these years, it seems like it's the most, can, can be the most confusing. And so having an expert there to help you is so helpful. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, I know for me in my journey, it's one of the more difficult things. 
especially because I know the triggers, but I don't always follow them. Um, that's but... psycho that's yeah, <laughs> behavioral psychology. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, and it's a fine line because you don't want to shame a patient for, you know, certainly where they are, are we're all human. Um, but it is important to trust our bodies and, and kind of trial and error, learn those triggers and, and, um, you know, do the best we can. Again, um, I think moderation, certainly if it's not a celiac disease or something like that, um, mm -hmm. I think moderation in all things is, is important. Um, but yes, I very much look forward to that session. Yeah. And I just, in my room to thrive, to thrive support group last week, someone said, do you ever offer groups on, on a different topic? Do you ever offer groups for care partners, like, you know, spouses or friends, or they're like, I want, I want, I'm sick and tired of explaining this to my partner. I want you to explain it to them. And I'm like, first of all, I get that. Like actually a lot of times people hear it differently when it comes from someone else, like an object, an outsider versus like their partner. But so I love it on the 5th of October, or if you're watching, if you're listening later, you can listen to the recording of um, the supporting care partner session. Yeah. And one thing I'll mention, so my husband, he was diagnosed with celiac about a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. and I jumped into action because I'm the autoimmune association. So mm -hmm. I felt like I had all the answers and quickly I learned the dynamic in a relationship where suddenly I was supporting him and needed to let him take the lead. And it was something that was a huge challenge to learn kind of firsthand. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot to the communication and, um, you know, that changes in the relationship. And so um, I certainly am, am excited that we're able to, to bring that one this year. And we have some phenomenal experts that will be joining that session. Yeah. And another one that I'm excited about, Dr. Kara Wada, on communicating effectively with your healthcare team. She also wears multiple hats, like Dr. Singh, like she's a doctor, but also has, you know, multiple chronic conditions. Um, and so, and she's also been on the Arthritis Life podcast before. And then Juana Mata from Fa Looms for Lupus. I got to meet her, I believe, at the ACR Co American College of Rheumatology Conference last year. Um, that's going to be great because there are so many ways that communication can be challenging in these pressured, like 15 to 20 minute appointments, right? That... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled. And yeah. yes, Juana, Kara, they're phenomenal. They're so wonderful. We're, we're excited about the lineup. Um, you can check it out if you go to go.autoimmune.org forward slash summit 2023. Okay. And and register there, see the full agenda and uh, get ready to join the community. Yeah. And um, I also have a link to it in my bio on Instagram and I'll put a link in the show notes too. How, uh, this is just out of curiosity. I'm sorry. I didn't ask you this before. How mm -hmm. long after the event will the recordings be up or is it kind of indefinite? Yeah. So last year we said about a week and I think it okay. was a couple of days. Um, okay. So I think I think this year it will be a couple of days. Let's okay. Go. Okay. So not, not super. So you gotta, you gotta act now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's wonderful. And I, there are also sessions on, you know, um, latest research and like the future of autoimmune disease treatment, which I'm always learning more. Those of you who listen to a previous episode, I just had these researchers from Ben Arroyo research Institute in Seattle on, and they're doing some phenomenal things about like, they actually blew my mind when they said they think there's going to be a cure for rheumatoid arthritis in my lifetime. Cause I was like, it's one thing for someone to say that like a random person on social media, but for like a PhD doctor researcher to say that, I was like, really? Wow. I didn't even dare to hope for that. You know? So anyway, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah they're doing some phenomenal things. So yeah, we're, we're looking forward to that as well. But yeah. So th thank you. I mean, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to share about this. And I, we're kind of now at the, um, rapid fire question Ooh. section of the podcast. All right. Hit me. Yes. <laughs> so what are some of your best words of wisdom for people who are newly diagnosed? Connect with others. Don't be afraid to share your story. Authent authenticity and vulnerability are really what connect us and we need each other. I love that. I love that. Yeah. It's so common to feel alone. Um, so connecting when you, maybe it's like 
most, it's like they say, like everyone, like someone asks this Buddhist monk, how often you should meditate. And they're like, you know, 30 minutes a day, or if you're really busy, it's 90 minutes a day. Kind of thing. It's like when you least want, <laughs> yeah, exactly. when you least want to connect is when it's most important to connect. Yes. Um, yeah. And then do you have a favorite inflammatory arthritis like gadget or tool in your toolbox? I actually have two. The okay. first one is physical therapy. For me, learning to stand, learning to sit and stretch and balance and really walk properly was was life changing. Mm-hmm. Um, bionic shoes um, oh. are another that actually was my one and a half. Um, nice. And the second one for me, swimming um, became a really important part of, of my treatment. Um, I feel so powerful and flexible in the pool and all the things. Um, it's a really good stress, stress reliever as well. I love it. I love being in the water too. I don't like chlorine, but the chlorine has gotten bad. I feel like chlorine technology has changed. It doesn't irritate my skin as much as it used to. Um, and do you have a favorite book or show you've been watching? Ten Lasso. Yes. I'm a believer. Yeah. Oh, so great. And do you have a like favorite mantra or inspirational saying? Back to swimming. <laughs> I think um, Dory from Finding Nemo really said it best. Just keep swimming. Oh my gosh. I say that to myself all the time (laughs) or just also after frozen two, it's like, just do the next best thing. Like, don't think 20 steps ahead. Sometimes you just got to take one step ahead. Yeah. Uh, What is, what's something that's been bringing you joy recently? So family, friends, um, and really the amazing people that I get to work with. Um, it's interesting working in a nonprofit, everybody that is connected wants to be there um so just being able to meet people like yourself cheryl who are inspirational and really doing amazing work for the autoimmune community is what brings me joy that's wonderful and i mean i think yeah you're in the right place i mean because yeah you are strong you're you're in the right place if that's what brings you you joy and i i'm amazed at the work that the uh, autoimmune association is doing i was telling you before we started recording but initially I connected to like the nonprofits that are specific to arthritis. And after a while, I was like, wait a minute, what's this autoimmune association? This is interesting. And like you said, there's this issue, right? Where there, there's, there wasn't, I think before the autoimmune association, correct me if I'm wrong, but there wasn't like one centralized place that was for, you know, advocacy, research, education, empowerment for patients with across the spectrum of autoimmune disorders, whether that's something that causes like a skin issue, whether it's something that causes a stomach issue. So you might, so you wouldn't necessarily like, um, long story short, yeah, people would, if your disease has the word arthritis in it, you might think, oh, the only opportunities for me to like learn are going to be from like organizations that are specific for arthritis, but it's like autoimmune actually (laughs) had, uh, our association has a lot of these things. I guess I'm just saying what we already said, but Uh, reiterating. And and we work very closely with arthritis association and and yeah. a lot of the other um communities and and run a coalition and certainly believe that a rising tide lifts all boats um we were founded in 1991 and like you mentioned we really um had a founder of virginia lad who started noticing autoimmune popping up within her family she comes from a very large family and just sort of her desire to dig deeper is what brought about the autoimmune association. And it's incredible in those 30 plus years, how far we are and yet how much further we realize that we have to go. Mm -hmm. Um, We were the American autoimmune related diseases association, ARDA um, prior to a year and a half, two years ago uh, when we rebranded to the autoimmune association, but same organization, um, just a you know kind of a modernization of of kind of who we are now and and where we'd like to go i had totally forgotten the old name but i did i did come across yeah. it maybe so i think autoimmune association is just easier to remember so that makes sense um and and it does encompass diseases that aren't 100 percent known to that's the thing that everything's a gray area with autoimmune so um but yeah i think that's i think that's great um, and then back to my little list list here. 
Um, what does it mean to you to live a good life and thrive with an autoimmune disease? That's a great question. I think for me, connection, empowerment, and community, mm -hmm. um, three things that you'll find at the autoimmune summit. I didn't uh, plan that. Um, <laughs> it will be taking place October 6th and 7th. I really am a firm believer in the power of community and the difference that we can all make together, um, lifting each other and sharing stories and um, just just kind of being one. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I really, I really appreciate um, the work that you're doing and the and you taking the time to be here, especially because I know from running my own educational summits um, that it is a lot those few weeks before or a week and a half before the event is a very busy time. So um, is there anything else you wanted to share with the audience before we wrap up? I don't think so. Um, just thank you so much for having me. It's been an honor and we hope to see all of you at the summit. Awesome. Oh, and can you say the, um, just, I always like to say it out loud, um, in addition to putting it in the show notes, what yeah. is the, like, where can people follow the autoimmune association on Instagram and social media? Yeah. So you can go to autoimmune.org is probably okay. the easiest yeah. place to start at the bottom of the page. You'll have a link to all of our socials. And then for the summit, it's go.autoimmune.org forward slash summit 2023. That's perfect. Okay. That's, that's so smart. I don't know why I didn't do that before. I'm always like, here's this link. Here's that link. Yeah. It's better to just say, here's the website where you'll find all of the links. That's super helpful. I hope to see some people listening at the, at the summit this year. And but if the time doesn't work for you this year, it's, it's an annual event, right? So it is, it is. And if you register, you'll get access to those recordings again, a couple of days after um, the summit. And uh, we're very excited. All right. Well, thank you so much again for taking the time to record today. And we'll talk to you soon at the, conference, at the summit. I mean, okay, bye. bye. bye.